On today's show, we are asking the questions the Cavs will begin answering in training camp. We'll dive into all angle of those and more. I want to thank you for making Lock On Cavs your first listen every day. Remember, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. That includes YouTube, where if you're watching us right now, hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, do us a solid. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. All right, the music you heard on the way in is from our friends at Astro Radio. Check them out on Apple Music or Spotify. I'm Chris Manning covering the Cavs and the NBA for, and NBA for places like Diamond Up Rocks and Espanish for the Sword. My co-host is Evan Damerel covering the Cleveland sports scene at Meta's right down Euclid. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, we're going to do two episodes today and tomorrow on training camp questions. We're going to do five questions today and five tomorrow. Uh, we're going to combine some of these into sections because they kind of fit together thematically. So I, I thought so as we were doing this, as I was doing these outlines. Evan, we're going to start with defensive changes in three big lineups. So the first question, I'm going to ask five minutes on the clock. How does the defense change post Donovan Mitchell trade year two under J.B. Bickerstaff fully year two of Evan Mobley? What changes post Mitchell? I think a little bit, obviously, on the interior, because you're expecting natural growth from Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. You're you're kind of getting more of the same uh, in terms of just secondary help alongside Darius Garland, because let's be frank, uh, Colin Sexton is not a plus defender. Karis LeVert was and still is not a plus defender. Isaac Okoro isn't going to be starting at the two for the Cavs, and he could start at the three. That's, that's the interesting variable of the starting lineup for Cleveland. Um... So I kind of wrote about this a little bit, and you can go check this out if you're the sword. Is is Jared Allen comfortable with being uncomfortable and defending on the perimeter, especially if a team forces a switch on him? And well, I'm sure we'll talk about this at length here, but it all depends on whether or not Evan Mobley is comfortable as well with kind of being forced to switch onto the perimeter. And as the the late great Don, Jonathan Shark said, like he has the potential to do that. It's just. Is he comfortable doing that heading into year two right out the gates? Or does this seem to be something we gradually ease Mobley into? We as in the coach, Cavs coaching staff here. Um, but yeah, I, I expect this team to be better defensively. I think there's going to be obviously some changes. Losing Larry Marketing could improve this team defensively a little bit. It could relieve some of the pressure. But at the same time, you get the same issue with Mitchell and Garland together. So that's just kind of where I'm at. I, I think it'll improve just because of natural growth of this team, especially because of your, as you would put it, aliens you have with Mobley and Allen. But how do you feel about it? So I, I'm a little less concerned about the Allen switching out thing than you. I think he's like, our, I think he's just like going to be fine. Like I, oh, I, I don't I think just... it, it's not a huge, huge concern of mine. It's just, if he's I, able I, to do that, like that could really take this defense like to a new new height. Yeah, I just think he already kind of can. Like it's, I think at Mobley is going to be better at it, but I think Allen is like comfortable. With it. I think what I think what will change is not a lot. I think the the biggest difference is that I think you were going to skew smaller because you don't have Markin in the, the three, and like Markin wasn't obviously like just locking up dudes and being seven feet and like being the seven foot wing stopper. He was providing size. He was contesting shots. He was just being large. The most common lineup last year with a non like non Markin of the three was like a, was a was a core at the three with Garland, Levert, Markin, and Mobley. Because Mark Nade is no longer on the team, you can obviously not going to see that lineup anymore. That's just not like a thing you you can function in the same way. Laverde played 21 possessions last year as a three, according mm -hmm. to the clean of the glass. That's obviously not the whole season. It's, you know, well, injuries played a part in that as well. But, like, there's an expectation that, like, maybe he's the incumbent or the favorite as training camp opens to start at the three. Okora played over a thousand possessions as a three last year. But, like, it's very Patrick lineups. The most common one played, like, under 200 possessions together. So, like, there's some of the wing defense stuff that I think 
is unclear. I think there are like built. I think like you are going to remain a good defense with basically the same principles uh -huh. and these two freaks at the back end, especially if Mobley takes a defensive leap in year two. I think there's also just going to be some built-in adjustments also because like Donovan Mitchell is going to be learning the scheme. You're going to be asking him to probably try harder than maybe he was at the tail end of his Utah career, let's put it, to put it nicely. There are some, I think, built-in adjustments, but I think this unit should, should still be like the defining characteristic of the team. Yeah. Yeah, I think defense, this is this will always be, okay, well, thank you, Alexa, but this will be always, most will always be like a defining characteristic of this Cavs team no matter what. Um but more so in this post Mitchell hierarchy, post Mitchell world, like the Cavs took a, a pretty, we talked about this quite a bit in Monday's episode, but like they took a pretty more dramatic leap offensively. And I feel pretty comfortable in saying that just because you're not getting a ton. Like, yes, Donovan Mitchell said like he hasn't been good up to this point on defense and maybe it's an effort thing. And maybe Jamie Bickerstaff can tap into something Quinn Snyder and the Jazz just were unable to do. But at the same time, um, this isn't a defensive upgrade for the Cavs. Like, you're really, really, really banking on the internal development of Mobley, and I feel comfortable in thinking, like, he has that trajectory. Um, to your point, I'm not, like, overly concerned with the Allen situation, but, like, he's going to be asked to do more, obviously, protecting the rim and, yeah. like, just doing more overall defensively. And, like, is he able to handle that and carry the load? I think he should be able to. Um, and then you're just kind of looking at like a Coro, like he said, Levert isn't like a plus defender, but he did play quite a few minutes at the three last year. So I think the Cavs are going to be asking him to play that hybrid. Look at us just making noises left and right on the show. Well, that is a timer because we need to move on to the other half of this question. Yeah. I, we have, we have bells and whistles, not on a board, just on my Apple watch. The, the other question about this is Arth, I, I'm asking this question sort of trolly and sort of like just in reality. Trolling Chris Manning. I tend to think that the three big lineups are not are dead, obviously, because you're not going to play like you're not going to listen. You're not going to play three seven footers anymore. You can't. John Michael Correct. cannot say on broadcast anymore. We are now playing. We are, the Cavs are playing three seven three seven footers, all that stuff. You can't do that. But I think this. I mean, my my theory, and I'm at the question is: Are these dead in spirit? And I would say the answer is no, because. Dean Wade's going to play some of that stuff. I think Lamar Stevens has the offensive repertoire as a four and, like, but can guard wings, right? Like, I think, like, it is obviously just not going to look exactly the same as it did last year, but, like, and it's not going to be, like, the main look they're throwing out, but it is still a look they have in their pocket depending on what personnel they want to use. Yeah, I, I... It will not be the core identity of this Cavalier squad. That's... I think you and I are in agreement on that. Like, I don't think... You're going to see Dean Wade as the opening night starting three because J.B. Bickerstaff is hell-bent and determined to play three bigs out there. I think it could be a wrinkle the Cavs employ. Maybe, like we've talked about this in the past, maybe the Cavs get real freaky with it and play Love, Mobley, and Allen out on the floor together with Garland and Mitchell together as well. And Chris is just exasperated by the suggestion, but... Yeah, Stevens is more or less a functional three who is in a four's body at this point for Cleveland. Dean Wade could be three, four, or five. Love is four or five for the Cavs, just in terms of just if you want to pencil them in as a specific like position. Um, but I think it's just the way the Cavs could kind of throw out different looks offensively. It makes them more multifaceted, and I said this on Monday's show, but instead of being static, they're a little bit more dynamic, because now they can go small, big, regular, in between, whatever they want to be. They can kind of just adapt to the situation put in front of them. So the Dean Wade part of this is the question to me, because I think if the numbers last year with him would lead you to believe that he is was most effective as a three. And I think like his rebounding numbers versus marketing, I think just the, his size, he's like six listed at like six, nine or whatever, six ten, nice. whatever he is. Mm. He's not seven feet like Larry marketing. So like, he's just a little bit smaller. He's a little bit slighter. I don't think he's quite as strong as marketing. And like, he, again, he's not going to be at 20. Like, I don't think at the end of games in the same way, either you're going to run like a pick and pop with Dean Wade in the way they might've with Larry market last year. So like, it is going to be a different look. It is a look. Certainly. I think they can turn to in little spurts. I'm curious to see just how, how I think there's just also the question of how much Mobley and Allen, but more so I think Mobley and what he kind of does defensively, I think really allows you to do some of these looks and like if that just unlocks them in perpetuity as the personnel rotates through and that's 
I think a question. I'm curious to see if the Cavs have like a take on that. Um, but Evan, after the break, okay, we're we're gonna go into some wings who maybe have opportunities. I guess now uh, post this trade, I, I guess. But first, gonna tell everyone about our friends at BetOnline. BetOnline.net is your number one source for your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season. Find all of the latest football league developments, game matchup news, and podcasts, including this year's opening week games for other sports and a bunch of other upcoming NFL weeks. BetOnline is also your continued source for your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. The fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. And soon, obviously, professional basketball is back. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. For instance, Evan Mobley is plus 1,600 to win Defensive Player of the Year. The Cavs over under, meanwhile, is set at 46 and a half wins after they acquired Donovan Mitchell. That's Bet Online, where the game starts. Go check them out today. All right, we're back. Second training camp question. Well, third training camp question. Second segment. Evan, let's start with let's start with Jetty Osmond because what do you make of Jetty Osmond in a post Donovan Mitchell world? He's more or less the same play. I mean, obviously, he's the same player. I think he's an erratic, streaky shooter who has happy feet on defense, I think is how you and I'd like to put it. He, he's very overzealous and kind of overcommits a little bit too much, and he's just positionally not a great defender for what the Cavs kind of need him to be. Um, I think more so, I like the focus with him, at least, is... How does he look like? Let's say he is your backup three, or he does get in minutes in this rotation at the start of the season. Is he deployed Halu Neto off the bench, or does he start and Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell kind of try to get him in a steady rhythm and balance early just so he isn't so erratic as a shooter? Because there is tangible evidence that shows that, like, Jetty Osmond was a pretty functional player for the Cavs when he played with Ricky Rubio last year because Rubio made, and ditto for Kevin Love because Rubio made a concerted effort to get both of those two kind of just rolling and then it was a snowball effect where like the momentum just carried with them throughout the rest of the uh, season at that point so up until Rubio went down so maybe that's just as a starter I don't like it in terms of perimeter defense but there are ways to make it functional enough offensively because Jetty at this point is like your only true small forward on this roster who can be considered one of the plus shooters from the three spot because Karis LeVert just isn't that. Isaac Okoro, we don't know if he is that. He, but he, like, he, history would suggest that he is not that no. he is not that. Yeah, so um, and I'm a firm Okoro believer, so that's why I tre- preface it with that, but it will be re- interesting to see, but like for now, no, I don't think so because I think you need to have Jetty in a bit more of a compartmentalized role where he's a little more Focused and streamlined, so you're not asking him to do too much, so it doesn't really cause more erratic results on the floor. Yeah, I, I think the question is not, does he start? I think that would be sort of surprising. I think the question is, like, is he like a more functional guy you kind of maybe try to play now and try to rehabilitate a little bit just because he does something you need? So 34.9% on, on f- near about four and a half attempts on catching two threes last year. Uh, on similar volume, that dipped to 32 and a half when Rubio got hurt. But so that's like not elite spacing, but it's not spacing other teams are are ignoring and saying like do what you want. Um, I think like if I think particularly Evan, he would. I'd be curious to see if he's someone they try with Mitchell, just because when it's Mitchell and not Garland, because I think what you might do in those situations schematically is say, okay, we want to let Donovan do Donovan things. And that involves pull up threes, pick and roll him getting to the rim and like trying to dunk on people and, and throwing lobs and or spraying to shooters mm-hmm. in terms of like building out lineups to do that with, like he's kind of one of the few guys you could turn it with. And also just like, look, the wing depth on this team is, is an issue. And like, is the bigger story of JD Osmond this season, ultimately like, this guy's a trade chip ultimately, and he's like used in another deal to bring in someone else they want. If it's him and Lavert, or just like him and what, like if if that's where he mm-hmm. ends up going, that wouldn't surprise me. There's also just like it's not like he is an average-ish NBA player, and I think people sometimes forget that like players that aren't superstars have like warts, and you have to ride the up and downs with them. Yeah, Jetty's a guy where now it's like what he does, and it's without a Baji there is insurance with like a real need for perimeter shooting 
I think there's like a world where like you could see him just kind of being there just because he'll be can overcome some of the other things and then like the shooting is just sort of needed because you don't have a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's where I'm at too when it comes to the Jetty thing is just the shooting is really and the lack of Ochai Abaji especially is really his horse in this race because before this Donovan Mitchell trade, you and I were talking about how like Jetty Osmond probably wouldn't even sniff the paint for the Cavs uh, one on a night to night basis just because there are so many players ahead of him and probably you can make a more compelling argument that like Lamar Stevens or Dean Wade probably earn minutes or deserve minutes at the back end of the rotation more than Jetty Osmond just because of what JV Bickerstaff kind of hopes for in a player. So I, I agree with you with using the similar approach. I think it'll unlock a lot of things for the Cavs offensively. Um, to your point in the last segment, I'm curious to see like if Evan Mobley is a bit of a shooter this year and he's able to maybe play like three, four, or five for the Cavs just because they're so positionless. Like that changes a lot of things too for them. But at least now, just heading into the season with based on what we know, like Jetty makes sense as a pretty safe, not a safe option, but an option to provide you some shooting, some actual wing depth on this roster. And I think he should just have a short early so that he doesn't burn the calves when he's like playing extended minutes and trying to do a little bit more than what you need him to do out there. Yes. Uh, the other guy in this conversation is Dylan Windler. And there's not a ton for us to say about Dylan Windler, but this, this is really it for him, Evan. Like it is now, this season is now or never for him Sticking, and we've been maybe we said this last year as well, but like this is the last year of the the rookie deal. Um, this is they picked up his option. He has this on paper skill set and frame that like theoretically make a lot of sense. This is also a guy who has played I think eighty one total games since becoming a professional. He's the same draft class as Darius Garland, and like you know the injury stuff is very unfortunate. Um, it, it is tricky but you know he's about to turn 26 like that's not old by any means but like it's just kind of the time where like you start moving off of a guy and they went they the rehabilitation from you're hoping kind of happened with the the charge stints last year with some of the other stuff and like he played 50 games last year didn't uh play like a ton of minutes i i guess we're just gonna kind of like if there's ever a time that dylan windler is gonna like figure it out in cleveland it, it feels like it's got to be right now yeah, it has to be right now, and whether, like you said, it's with the charge or, like he kind of did last year, and I think that's just more than anything after just talking to Dan Jarreau when he was head coach of the charge or just talking to J.B. Picker stuff about it in general, like the Cavs had a clear pecking order last season, and Dylan Wendler wasn't part of it. Like, yes, he did provide some pretty good minutes when they were, had to lean on him, but then that petered off pretty quickly because he just doesn't have the cap capacity to play consistent NBA minutes on a night night basis because like you said he's in the same draft class as Darius Garland but has played less than 90 games at this point and that's that's just he just doesn't have the tr the tread on his tires to really keep going at this at this juncture so there could be an avenue and an opportunity for Will Windler to get minutes like he is a bigger body in terms of a wing player he does play defense well he does rebound the ball well he does know how to move the basketball um, he doesn't try to do too much as a player when on the floor because he just tries to be a functional piece. Like, I, I kind of view him, and it's a shame just because of his pedigree as a player puts him in a different echelon than Lamar Stevens or Dean Wade at this point. But if you called on Dylan Windler's number and said, hey, Dylan, we need you to play 10, 15 minutes tonight and provide us X, Y, and Z, he'll provide you X, Y, and Z without giving you A, B, and C that could harm you as well. And I think that's a beneficial thing with Windler, but... More than anything, like we talked about several times of this show, they picked up his option for this final season. This could be his last year at the Cavs. And I think more than anything, like one, yes, maybe they do believe in his internal development and growth. But two, more than anything, it's a trade ship because he's a cheap player that maybe a bad team could take a really a, a bigger stab at and kind of see maybe if they have something there or not. Or the Cavs don't really have that opportunity because if they don't find him minutes he's not going to crack the rotation otherwise because like he has to really do something to like stake a claim in this like nine ten man rotation the Cavs are building yes all right one last break we're going to come back we are going to talk about how the offense overall might change with Donovan Mitchell we're going to do a bigger episode on that but I think the idea with some of these questions is to tease them, go to media day, ask some questions, come back with a little bit more information aside from just speculation, and move on. We'll be right back. All right, last segment on Lockdown Cavs. I'm Chris Manning. That is Evan Damerell. 
Okay, Evan, last year, quick stats to run through. Cavs were 19th on offense, according to the clean of the glass, 19th in three-point rate, 5th in rim rate, 20th in mid-range rate. 15, they were 15th in three-point percentage uh, in terms of how many they made, 10th at, in percentage at the rim. Mm -hmm. Mitchell is going to drive up that three-point rate without, I think, really changing a ton about their how much they're getting to the rim. Uh, I, I think that is really the place to wonder is like, okay, how does how does Mitchell change it? Is it because of his pull-ups? Does he provide more off-ball spacing? Because you are losing Markin in as well, who was one of your big three-point shooters, but I just Mitchell is so three-point heavy and is gonna carry such an offensive load in a way Markin didn't that I, I kind of just imagine the first thing that changes is they're gonna take more threes this year just based on the fact that Donovan Mitchell is going to take more threes. Yeah, we, we talked about this a little bit in Monday's episode where the, the Cavs, both between Garland and Mitchell, are going to have a lot of three-point gravity between them, and I think they can do some creative things playing off one another, maybe just with off-ball in general, using Mobley as an offensive hub could be kind of some interesting wrinkles the Cavs could deploy offensively too. But the real indicator here is how comfortable or how much will the catch and shoot numbers for Donovan Mitchell go up versus just standard pull up numbers and ditto for Darius Garland. Will there be a little bit more of a blurred through line for those two? And I think we'll find it. It's not going to be perfect right away. I know you asked me on Monday, hey, do you think the Cavs are going to have this figured out the start of the season? No, they're not. But I think just, yeah, naturally the Cavs are going to have more three point shooting because. Now it's not just Darius Garland, Larry Markkinen, and Kevin Love with Markkinen kind of being an interesting X factor because he's somewhat streaky at times as a shooter. Um, now you have Garland, you have Love, you have Mitchell. Um, maybe Evan Mobley gives you something. Then maybe Isaac Okoro gives you something. Maybe um, there's still a lot of variables with this, but I think I feel more comfortable in saying, like, yes, Mitchell is going to change the shooting aspect of this team pretty dramatically compared to what Larry Mark at least provided. And maybe the Cavs can have a little bit more of a semblance of a modern offense, or if they do like to play from the inside out, which is something that J.B. Bickerstaff likes to preach a lot, is he calls it the fetishization of the three-pointer, which is an interesting way to put it either way. But establishing a presence in the paint, which they have more than enough bodies to do that, and then they let it just matriculate out to the three-point line, and now the Cavs have two pretty good shooters in their backcourt to do that. The other part of this, Evan, and I th I'm curious to see how it looks, and this is like probably the most me thing ever to some degree, but I look at the off-ball stuff, and it's just like, I don't know how you can, this, some of this stuff just looks the same, right? Like, Markkinen was the spacer last year, so like, is Mitchell somewhat now like the spacer when the ball is not in his hands? Is Garland doing that? Um, in that sense, like, what is Okoro or Levert doing that situation? Because they are, are not shooters like they are just not going to provide shooting for you in, in that way um Levert maybe gets a little more attention but like neither of them have shown to be really dynamic cutters into that space either like I think there's something there that will take time to figure out and I think going hand in hand in that is like how does Evan Mobley's offensive offense change in year two and how does that sort of factor into this because like do they decide to empower him and and then like Garland and, and Mitchell are the spacers in certain situations like the, I mentioned this on the pod a couple weeks ago um and I'll I'll put the link in, in the in the notes for the show, but it's like there's the Asia Wilson drive and score I mentioned a few weeks back that is like mm -hmm. a staple of what she does for the Aces who just won a WNBA title. And like, is there something with, with that they can do that with Mobley where maybe like Allen's in the dunker spot and they space it out with shooting? Like, I think there's just things that change. I also just don't really feel like we can really say what these scheme changes are until like we see them but i think it's pretty clear that we can guess at the shot profile change do you, does that seem fair to you yeah i think that's a pretty fair assessment like i think that just the there's only so many touches that go around i just think the offensive dichotomy this Cavs team is going to change quite a bit it's going to be more three-point heavy maybe it's a little bit more of a balance instead of interior pressure it's a healthier balance of three-point and interior pressure with maybe a little bit of mid-range sprinkled in, of course, as well. Is there is there someone you feel like has the most pressure that you feel like has the most kind of, I guess, like at stake in sort of this hierarchy change? Because there's someone that you feel like could really pop in, this, in these changes if, if they can kind of just succeed. 
Uh, Isaac Okoro is usually my answer for this one just because he has a lot of questions about him as a player. Like, how does he function? Because he's just been up and down as a rookie. And as Richard Jefferson said, he is a top five pick, so he does have a bit of a pedigree to him. But there's a lot of questions about him as a player. And do the Cavs want to keep him around because he is able to be a functional, like low usage wing where he gives you 10 to possibly 12 or 15 points a night, uh, solid defense and just maybe some secondary play creation as well. Like, does he do that or does he still not really be able to shoot the rock and he struggles and he's inconsistent offensively. And like, there's the idea of ice core, but the Cavs don't have that luxury to build around it. So, it's kind of put up or shut up time now for the Cavs. Like they have a three to four year window, depending on how things go with Mitchell's contract to really like make some noise in the Eastern conference and shift things along the rookie scale contract of Evan Mobley and Garland's maximum extension and the remainder of Allen's extension as well to kind of like figure this out. And they don't really ha have that runway to let Isaac Okoro still grow and learn from his mistakes. So he kind of has to, work on his game during the offseason all players do this obviously and we're hoping to see that maybe that he takes that leap but if not maybe like the Cavs have to sell ship and look elsewhere at the wing spot because like, that's just going to be the biggest question about Cleveland is like their overwhelming lack of wing depth and just not really having a clear cut answer as a starting three heading into the season like the, and according to me is like that guy but I don't know who, who's your who's your guy who thinks who you think is in that vein I, I like the sicko in me is like Jetty Osman, just because of the shooting. <laughs> I mean, it's not really sicko like, in you. Like if he's able to find stability and like everything in between, like that that that's that's a uh, it works. Yeah, but it's just like I can also just envision like two games of Happy Feet and JB Bakersaf is like I'm done. Get, 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 get me a man who's not gonna like. Who's gonna like shoulder things on defense? Like or, Lamar like, Stevens, I, you can't shoot a lick, but brother, you can defend. Look, if Lamar, Lamar is also like the other answer because like that dude's frame is like built for some of the stuff they really could use, and then it's also but it's just like the, the shooting. If he's just like averageish and can like hit corner threes, like that's a win. But it's like also like his numbers are worse than the cores last year, so like I'm not sure like how. Uh, like it is. Uh, Evan, let real quick at the end of the show, we do have some. I wish we had like a a, a sound just to play, but we we don't. We're not that fancy at this point in time. Uh, oh various God. reports, I think, first from Shams Jirani, also Chris Haynes of Yahoo. Cavs are signing guard Sharif Cooper to a training camp deal. Uh, I texted friend of the program Brad Roland uh, for his uh, scouting report because Sharif Cooper was with the College Park Skyhawks, I believe the name of their G League team is, and his this is his. Uh, instant analysis. This is what you get going to Lockdown Cavs. I think the upside is there, but I still can't tell you how bad he was at Summer League. Like, jarringly bad. He was good in the G League last year and is like 21 still. So, I he's 6'1", fast. I think the Cavs liked him when he came out of college. Yes, they did. Um, is the, it, it is probably likely he's like, this is like, let's get his G League rights and like, figure it out. It's on a... He's, I like Sharif Cooper. He was objectively horrible for the Hawks during Summer League this summer. Um, to Brad's credit, he's 21 years old and is still in the G League. Like, there's there could be something there, but I think, hey, maybe Mike Garrity can figure it out. And this certainly makes the charge a lot more interesting with Sharif Cooper, Isaiah Mobley, and um, RJ Nemhart at least to kind of, and maybe Kyle Guy too. Like that that's that's a squad right there. Yeah, I, I say, Nemhard, Cooper, and, and Mobley is like fun G League stuff. So like, like Sharif Cooper juices me, and this is a situation where if he develops well enough, he could be like that third guard in your lineup instead of Halu Neto, but he's a heck of a lot cheaper, and he's also younger, so you can continue growing and developing him, and then eventually maybe figuring him out as like your backup guard, or he's your third point guard off the bench for you. This, yeah, this to me feels almost like... Um, it's like an it's an iron in the fire to perhaps have someone be the backup point guard or like the the netto replacement a year from now yeah just yeah. this like that's what this strikes me as cuz like for, yeah, folks they have rubio he's, unless rubio is like five star to be cooked like so, so yeah that's the other thing is like if he's cooked but 
they they check their uh, SEC quota of shortish guards on their roster this and, year. Well, and, sure. and Atlanta. This is another Atlanta guy. There you go. I, I believe he played. I think I'm googling this as we do this, but I he believe he's from, from New Jersey. He played. Oh, he played it. Yeah, he played at Auburn. This is another Auburn Tiger. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, that. I believe that is the Isaac Okoro uh, connection there. I at least like there. Auburn yeah. products. Uh, yeah, and it went to and he went to high school in Georgia. So I wasn't hallucinating that. That's that means my brain is is working great. All right, we're gonna be back tomorrow uh, with another half of our training camp question episode. So that'll be five more questions. Hope you tune in for that. Uh, thanks for making Lockdown Cavs your first listen every day. This episode was produced by Jake Stevens, and this is your team every day. Uh, now go and make NBA Top 50 on Locked On NBA your second listen. Which NBA player moves the betting line most this season? Locked On and the Bet Online Odds Makers present the NBA Top 50 Most Valuable Players. Find it on Locked On NBA wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube.